Steve, I want to thank you and I want to wish you a happy new year. And I want to ask you to look at the year behind us, the big picture, as you always do. And tell us, where's the fight going next? Because you are a man that has basically taken the world stage by storm by being the one of the few guys in the world who's able to see the direction of this sort of global populist movement and where it's going. And also on a, on a micro level, uh, what's happening in D.C.? You know, it, it, I, it, regardless of where I've, I've been since I left the White House, whether it was in Japan, talking to um, – to these dissidents throughout, uh, you know, the human rights people and in, in, uh, throughout Asia that all collected in Japan to come for a speech or going back and giving a speech at CPAC, Japan, or talking uh, to the Border Patrol people out in Arizona, the evangelicals in Washington and Colorado Springs, no matter if it was the high or the mighty, right? It, I've always kind of given the same speech or at least part of it, which is what I call, Rebecca, the Trump miracle versus – um, the nullification project. And I think President Trump has just had an extraordinary year. I think he's accomplished tremendous things. I, I look on in three areas, um, our sovereignty, the economy, and our security. And I think in all three, you know, he stopped, dramatically stopped illegal immigration. He's really uh, focused on, um, on deporting those that should be deported. Uh, he's gotten our sovereignty back. He's, he's making all preparations to get funding and to build the wall. Uh, he's on the economy. It's been we're, the Fed in New York is projecting four percent growth pre-tax cut, and I understand where the tax cuts baked in there. But I just saw a guy the other day, a Democrat, saying that in nineteen in, in the years nineteen and twenty, he thinks he could see four to five percent growth. So, in the national security, he's done an amazing job. He's, he's destroyed the physical caliphate of ISIS, and nobody talks about this. He's actually destroyed a, 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 a group that had a country, had formed a country between Iraq and Syria that was more vibrant than those two states and had 8 million people under slavery. He freed 8 million people. Uh, not just that, he got our allies in the Gulf, the UAE and the Saudi Arabia and Egypt and Bahrain to act in unison – to try to shut down radical is the fin- financing of radical Islamic terrorism. So be- between calling out Korea, calling out Iran, doing all these things and getting people that normally don't move quickly to move in unison and to move quickly, it's been extraordinary. So I think the year has just been one of a conference. Now, the counterpoint to that has been a wall of resistance, and this just hasn't been from the progressive left. It's been the opposition party media. And, and quite frankly, it's been the Republican establishment. And I've said from day one, as soon as he gets his tax bill, which I think the tax bill he got through, the way he got through is kind of miraculous. I do agree we needed these corporate tax cuts to make our corporations more competitive with Germany and, and places like China. I think you've already seen where the Chinese are starting to waive some taxes because of the concerns. So I think this was a strategic tax cut. Um, I, I just fear that once he got that done, it's going to revert to the mean is going to revert to the establishment. The Republican establishment is going to have no more use for him in fighting him on everything, whether it's infrastructure, whether it's immigration, whether it's the border wall, et cetera. So I think President Trump has done an extraordinary job, given the resistance that he's met on Capitol Hill and inside the deep state bureaucracy and across, you know, all the, you know, all the um, globalist, uh, you know, worldwide and, and also the opposition party media. So I think it's been a miraculous year. I call it the Trump miracle. And I think it's only going to get more intense. I think if, if you felt that the news cycle was compressed in 2017 and every, you know, the tr- first year of the Trump administration, I know people say it feels like four years of Obama's. Well, I think 18 is going to start off, you know, Matt Boyle had this great piece to frame some congressmen. He had talked to some congressmen that said that the, 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 the last 20 days of the first year of the Trump administration, which is basically uh, essentially from now to the 20th, when the spending bill has got to be done. Will will set the the whole framework for his entire presidency. Will be a defining moment, and I think it's it's almost like a it's almost like we wrote a movie. Rebecca, you and I wrote a movie. They would throw us out of the room if we pitched the script. <laughs> I think it's, I think it's all coming to a head. And you know, because it's just too it's almost too dramatic. And I think it's going to come to a head over the next three or four weeks. That will set the tone for the next year. But I think it'll be incredibly intense. Just look for President Trump to be a fighter. I think every day he he reverts back closer to the base. And I think it's great. I think that's why he's getting so much stuff accomplished. 
Now, you know what's so astonishing uh, to me, it, 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 exactly, this the ability to get stuff uh, uh, accomplished, and yet when you turn on the news... This opposition media, as you as you put it so so uh, so perfectly, the uh, the opposition party has become the media. Um, the Democratic Party itself has just completely collapsed uh, since the election. You know they really don't have anybody uh, that's that's kind of the mouthpiece for that party, and the party itself just seems to to be you know unfocused. And yet the opposition party media is completely focused, and everything that they are reporting is just completely negative, and it's it's very much periphery uh, in the periphery of what the was but actually going think, on. I do think, I do think that in the could be linked though. I, the one thing I disagree, I, I think the resistance, which came up on that really that it started from the day that Trump was elected. They never accepted him as president. It really built momentum on that first weekend when we had the, uh, when we had the travel ban, uh, which the Supreme court obviously said was, was, you know, the extreme vetting was fine. Um, and it's, I think you have a resistance and you have an opposition party media. They don't have anything positive to add, but they're going to fight Trump every step of the way. And I can understand that. I don't agree with it, obviously, but I see what they're doing. I see the tactic. It's, it's a scorched earth policy. And it is getting they, – they are – because as you know, that type of anger can have results. They, they, had, they had solid results in Virginia. They had solid results in Alabama. They're turning out people. The opposition – now, they're having a tough time dealing with the facts. The facts are Trump's economic nationalism. It's already gotten you great results in the economy, and now with this tax cut, what's going to be an accelerant, and it's a deficit finance tax cut. It should throw a lot of gasoline on the fire. Um, you can could, you could have upwards of 4 to 5% growth. You've already seen um, you know, p- problems in the labor market, which I think is terrific because wages are going to rise, and we're all about what, uh, rising wages. So I think the Democrats have yet to get their sea legs on how to counter Trump's program. And here's the reason, Rebecca, we talk about it all the time. They're so hung up in identity politics, they can't get their arms around the basic underlying economics, which used to be their issues. Trump has kind of stolen the lunch pail issues, the dinner table issues that the Democrats used to own. Only two Republicans have ever owned that, Ronald Reagan and Donald Trump. And guess what? Both of those guys were, were Democrats most of their adult lives, right? <laughs> they know how to they know well they know how to they know how to talk about you know, they know how to talk in a certain vernacular. They don't talk like Republicans. They talk that's like just they it. talk like people that can that's connect to it. working class people and that's what their power is. And that's what the Democratic Party is going through a huge identity crisis. Well, look, both parties are. We're really seeing the transformation of the parties. You can't think of Democrat, or Republican, or conservative, and it's really globalist and nationalist. I think it's where this comes out. Uh, and by nationalist, I mean people that look at what's in the best interest of the United States first, what's in the best interest of our citizens first, and not worry about these global institutions that that, that the uh, party of Davos elite in the world, in particular our country, kind of calto to. So I think that that is really the break. The, the, what's breaking up, and I see. I think you're seeing people on the left and the right start to work together on projects, just like you see the Uniparty establishment work on projects. So I think Trump's had a heck of a, a first year. I, I'm so glad uh, that I'm back and can and can share in it with uh, the SiriusXM audience. I think the, the, the having the evening show where we have you and Joel anchoring out on the West Coast. Uh, with some, you know, Alex and I throwing in every now and again, Raheem taking over the weekend show. I think it's, it's settling in as, you know, we're going to be doing 40 hours, 45 hours every week, week in and week out of live radio. And I just think it's fantastic. And uh, and I think the year ahead is just buckle, buckle up. You know what? I want to just one quick thing, one, the point that you made about Ronald Reagan and Donald Trump both speaking to working class voters, that vernacular, because they came from a Democrat background. Ronald Reagan voted for, for you know, uh, FDR four times. You know, Ronald Reagan was actually the guy that saved Social Security with Tip O'Neill. I want to say there was another guy on the, on the, the stage right now that, I, that talks that same language, and that's you. You came from a blue collar, uh, you know, uh, Reagan, you know, Democrat family who uh, and also you're a, uh, you know, a major supporter of Ronald Reagan. You even made a documentary film about him and the issues that you helped articulate in the 2016 election, these economic nationalist issues that just sort of took the the Beltway GOP, sort of the conservative Inc. establishment by storm. What I would what I'm curious about is because these issues are so new to them or they've forgotten them or they've forgotten how to win on them. uh, Do we are we creating enough of an apparatus, enough of a think tank apparatus going forward so that 
uh, politicians like Donald Trump have people to choose from to fill their administration with, have the, the have policy build, you folks. Have build, you have to build those institutions. The answer is no. You're going to have to. You see a little bit coming out. Some people at Heritage are doing this now. You see some smaller think tanks. You see the uh, Journal of American Greatness, a couple of these journals. The answer is no. You, we got to build policy. We got to build thing, you know, the think tanks or action tanks, however you want to call them. Um, you know, even after Reagan, and this is this great book by, by Henry Olson, that, you know, this, this interpretation of Reagan, was he really a libertarian or was he more of a populist and nationalist is, is the debate that's going on now. No, th- those institutions have to be built and those kind of policy prescriptions have to be come up, uh, come up with. Look, we're in the very early stages of this. It's been building for, you know, 10 or 15 years. But this is still the very early parts of this movement. The reason Trump is so natural in this and connects so well is he's been talking about this stuff for 30 and 40 years. You know, we were doing the show the other day, Alex and I, in the morning, and we were focused that the evening after I did the hour with you and Joel about uh, North Korea and China. We did an entire three hours on it. And the audience is coached up. But the, one of the reasons is they've been listening to guys like Lou Dobbs and Donald Trump for 20, 30 years. I mean, they can, a couple of guys were relating back to Trump's stuff Trump said back in the 80s and 90s about China and trade. So this is, you know, where Trump is a natural and where he, the president has, um, you know, the president has, is very comfortable with this. That's why, look, what's going to happen in the next couple of weeks on trade is going to be very uh, emblematic, I think, of what's going to happen as administration going forward, because it's a very nationalist group over in the White House of Peter Navarro and Stephen Miller and Lighthizer that have, have been pushing hard these trade policies that are really going to start to get jobs back and give us a level playing field. And they've been They've been fought tooth and nail by the Wall Street crowd, and it's going to see which you know direction. Now, President Trump, he's read the Riot Act to the Chinese over the last couple of days. In particular, I think the New York Times was very insightful where he said, hey, I did go – he used the word. He says, I was soft on these guys. I was soft on China for the first year, hoping they would help me out more in North Korea. They're clearly not doing it. They're shipping oil behind my back. Uh, like we've been saying they've been doing, president called him out, and now he's saying, "Hey, we're going to get tough on we're going to get tough on trade." So, I think it's uh, it's going to be quite interesting to see how President Trump relates to his base going forward, and particularly the working class men and women of Wisconsin, and Michigan, your home state, uh, Ohio, and Pennsylvania and Iowa, those big upper Midwest states that are the really the foundation of the Trump movement. Okay, now I'm not. Go- I, I I could go for a cheap shot here and ask you to predict whether we're going to keep the House and Senate in 2018, but that's kind of a that's too easy. So instead, and, and I don't want to get you. I don't want to make you put you on the record on that because it's it's too it's too difficult for anybody to predict. But I want to ask you instead: um, Is there a story do you think that is happening, or some situation, or some issue on the world stage, or in the country that not enough attention is being focused on that you think could potentially become an area of intense interest in 2018 or beyond? 2018? Oh, I think I think one of the big stories is only now starting to be covered is. Uh, the consolidation of technology and, and the power of these technology companies. I think these, and I think this is where you're going to see. You know, people say reach across the aisle. I think you'll see people on the left and the right come together. That places companies like Google and Facebook and Twitter. Some of these companies are too. It's too much concentration of power. They're too big. They're 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 run by kids. Uh, it's something's got to be done about it. And I think you're going to see a lot of movement. I think it's a very underreported story right now. And I think it's going to be a very big reported story uh, this coming year. I think of the fight over tech and the direction of tech and the lords of technology and, and the kind of open borders, uh, you know, the post-national mentality is all going to be called to account. So I think it's going to be hit big. The other one I think is just starting to come up is the advances in AI. I think the convergence, the, the point's called the singularity, but I think the mm-hmm. convergence of, of, uh, of robotics in artificial intelligence, in Moore's law of the increase in the, uh, the speed and sophistication of the silicon chip, the merger of those coming forward in the future are going to have fundamental changes uh, for mankind. It's one of the reasons, Rebecca, that, as you know, we're populist at Breitbart. And one of the reasons is we don't want to see the same problems that what, you know, globalization kind of caught everybody. People didn't pay attention to it, and all of a sudden it was a system that kind of changed the world, and I think changed the world in many respects not for the better. Uh, particularly in the United States, uh, you can't have that happen. The second thing that's going to happen in the next 10 or 15 years, which is going to be these tremendous advances in science and technology that are really have the potential to really change what it, what humankind is 
And in that regard, we have to have everybody's got to be at the table. Everybody's got to have a say so in this. You just can't turn it over to a scientific, managerial, uh, technocratic elite. If we do that, uh, the human race is going to be in a big problem. So I think tech, both its concentration of power in social media and other areas, and this whole advances of, of in, in technology. You see guys like the guy that owns Tesla, uh, uh, Elon Musk, and others started to talk about it. Now, I think those are two massively underreported stories that are going to become huge as we get into 2018. Interesting. And and as you said, one time I recall that you describing the lords of tech as nihilists, which was that was an eye opener and something that uh, that definitely made me my, my ears perk up that we do not want a sort of a, a, anyone with a sort of nihilistic instinct um, who's arrogant and, and unregulated to be in solely in charge of these sorts of decisions that could change the shape of things you know, to come. Look, one of the parts of this right-wing uh, populism is is really deconstruction administrators. It's really to be more entrepreneurial, to have more entrepreneurial finance, more entrepreneurial capital, a more entrepreneurial way of looking at things. We stand 100% opposed to state-controlled capitalism. That's really what China is today. It's, I believe, where the United States under Obama was heading, a handful of large companies right, that are in bed with government that, uh, that really uh, you know, treat uh, people like the, a proletariat. And I think that's what we're trying to break up. I think that's why the White House Counsel's Office has done such an amazing job for President Trump in, in, in deregulating the country. Now, on the other hand, we're not people that run around and beg for a lot of regulation. But with these big tech companies, particularly with the, all this data they pick up and in social media, I do believe some regulation is necessary. I've been a big proponent that the data that's collected by Google and Facebook and others should be in a public trust. And that data should be, have access to co- companies that are – that are up and coming and more entrepreneurial so they can help help build their own businesses around it. But I think that regulation, almost like the utility, is definitely going to come to things like Facebook and Google. They're going to fight it tooth and nail because they've got so much money they've poured into Washington. I mean, it is the epitome of the swamp fight uh, that we're going to have in trying to bring these companies to heel. Okay, can I do a series of like quick yes nos or, or, or quick takes on sure. stuff for you? Sure. Okay, uh, I'm, not hot, I'm not a hot take guy, but I'll, I'll, you're not a hot take guy. But I just want some just some quick ones. You're the host. I'm just another friend for calling in. Just, some, just, some, and you, and you can also, and you can always decline to say, no, nah, I'm not making that prediction. Re- okay, re- well, re- rem- re- rem- remember, remember, I can always, I've been deposed of. I can always say I don't remember. <laughs> You can always, yeah, you can always play the fifth, uh, even on the call. Okay, so um, wall construction in 2018, do you think it starts? In 2018, yes, absolutely. Okay. Um, do you think DACA happens in 2018, a DACA amnesty? I do not, no. Okay. Uh, do you think, we, oh, <laughs> I told you I wasn't going to ask you this, but I'll, I'll just say a 50% chance, a 60% chance that we keep the house or lose it, do you think? Well, I think if I think if DACA, if the president signs something regarding amnesty, I think we lose the house. I've said that from day one. I think I think right now, it, particularly with the economy where it is, is that you know all things being equal, uh, I think we pick up a handful, a couple of seats in the Senate. You know, anywhere from three to five seats in the Senate, and I think you hold the house. That's that's what I predict right now. You know, and look, it's tough to predict. I'm not a big, you know, prognosticator, but I think as you see things right now, you should be able to pick up some seats, hold the Senate, pick up a couple of seats. And I think hold the House. Now, if you do something that I think goes against the, the vast majority of your voting base, like give amnesty, uh, then all bets are off. So that's the one thing about 18. It's a, this is going to be a day-by-day thing right now because I think the economy, the tax cut, I think economic nationalism is kicking in. I, I don't think the president gets the credit. I don't think he gets the credit for his wins on national security and foreign policy. I think that all starts to come back to him in the spring and the summer, but it, uh, it also depends on some of the things that are going to happen in the next, uh, you know, in the next uh, 30 to 60 days. Thank you so much, Stephen K. Bannon, our very own street fighting man. And uh, I want to thank you and I want to wish you and your family a happy new year's. Well, Rebecca, I got to tell you, I, I, I'm so proud of, of how you come on the team and just done an amazing job. But what I'm really proud of is not just your editorial and managerial skills, but you've, you've blossomed into truly, I am mean, as a great radio host, and it's uh, I love listening to your show even when I'm not on it. You've got a great way about you, and I know already that the audience just loves you. So it's uh, you've got, you got a long career ahead of you. Oh, thank you so much, Steve. I learned from the best. That would be you. So I, I do appreciate everything that you, you've done Happy for us. Happy New Year, girl. And that concludes our Breitbart News special New Year's Eve edition of the show.